Can I wait for the mic or I'll just go? Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, Ann Crittenden, I'm a writer, and I've written a play about some of these issues. And I'd like to get back to um, a general question of how effective, who are you reaching with these, this message, this very powerful message, really? How, how, how do you think you're affecting the course of our behavior? And specifically with the likelihood there will ever be any kind of accounting? And two, the influence on the uh, policies of rendition, which I understand are not renounced and may still be ongoing. Uh, the, the latter question, you know, rendition's uh, a topic that I'm not, in, you know, I've never, never really uh, engaged in or had anything to do with. Uh, and I oppose it simply because I, I think it's against the law uh, and I think it's wrong, but it also, I think, just violates our principles that, uh, you know, and plus, I think we should just have the courage. If we detain people, then we should detain them and process them and be the ones that are responsible for them. Uh, do I think the message is reaching people? Yes, but how many people is the question. Uh, most polls, uh, you know, a question earlier about polls, I wanted to address something. The polling is actually extremely uh, dependent upon the wording of the question. We know that if we phrase a question that says, do you support enhanced interrogation techniques if it keeps Americans safe, that the large majority of people will say yes. But what's loaded in that question, you talk about loaded questions, is that they work. Or that they don't recruit new terrorists that down the road make us less safe. Or that they're enhanced interrogation techniques and not torture. So the polls... Yeah, you quote this morning that and the current administration is soft on terrorism. Quote. Yeah, there's no soft or hard in this <coughs> argument. There's effective and non-effective. And those arguments have to be made from both the short and long-term perspective. Um, and so w what I would say is, uh, are we reaching people? I think yes, and I've had, I can only go by my personal experience that people have come up to me and said, you know, I've had pe some people say, I think we could use enhanced interrogation techniques sometimes, but you know what, if your methods work better and faster, then I'm okay with giving up on those. That's fine, I think, as a band-aid, but the, the question goes back to why do we torture? I mean, why would somebody torture another human being? Uh, and I think that goes back to prejudice, and that's what I think is the long-term uh, fight in this argument, is how do we eradicate the prejudice? Because we didn't torture people after the attack on Pearl, uh, Pearl Harbor even though other attacks were imminent, and if you can make the argument it was effective, it would have saved lives. So. Okay, we're going to take uh, just questions bunched together because we're almost out of time. So you have a question in the back, sir? And then you have a question. Thanks. Since the de debate over torture uh, uh, surfaced in the United States after 9-11, it seems that there's a growing class of former interrogators or current inter interrogators like yourself who take positions uh, on whether torture works. And they lined up on both sides of this issue. And I'd like you to diagnose the, the, the divergence here. What explains it? Is it more your emphasis on the long-term effects of using torture? Or is it that the interrogators who've lined up on both sides of this debate have had very different experiences and honestly feel differently about whether it works in the short term as well? Okay, and your question? Very much. I'm Rachel Neal with Open Society Justice Initiative, and I wanted to ask if you had any thoughts about the lessons from your own experience in a slightly different arena, which is that of trying to detect and deter people in the process of radicalization within our countries. Um, Jihad Jane was on the front page um, of the Washington Post this morning, and I'm doing work in, in Western Europe where we're looking at ethnic profiling and the role of a focus on religious practice, um, Islamicism in particular, in efforts to detect persons in the process of radicalization. And we've been quite critical of what we see as um, an excessive and stereotypical focus on religion, um, both in sort of looking at behavioral patterns, but then also when people are brought in for any kind of questioning. Um, they're often asked a great deal about their religious practice. Uh, it was actually suggested to us by a senior French intelligence officer that um, the police should simply be barred from asking anything about religion and should focus entirely on actions um, 
behaviours networks, etc. instead. So I'd just be interested to get your thoughts on that and, and if you think there are sort of key lessons and indeed if there's a conversation starting here, given that both the NYPD and the LAPD have been looking at these issues um, and the NYPD brought out a major report a little while ago about this. Um, let me answer that question first. Uh, what, what I learned in Iraq is that people join and, and resort to violence for very personal reasons. Uh, it can be, uh, in, in the case of the one imam who was blessing suicide bombers, it was because a Shia militia had come to his neighborhood and assassinated his best friend and forced him to move from his house and give up his business. He sent suicide bombers out against Shia civilians in marketplaces. He later admitted to me after he started to cooperate that his mother was Shia. Imagine the feelings he must have had inside that he had to overcome to be able to participate in that type of activity. It was extremely personal to him because of the assassination of his friend, because of the loss of everything in his life and his pride uh, and his honor and being able to support his family. They're very personal reasons and I would say the most uh, drawing reasons or the most powerful reasons for Al-Qaeda to be able to recruit are intangible. The same way that my most powerful weapons in the interrogation booth, my most powerful incentives are intangible. Uh, you know, numerous times I was in, but sometimes I could come in and throw $10,000 on the table uh, and that wouldn't move anybody at all. Uh, but if I appealed to their honor and respect um, and their pride, that would be much more uh, powerful. But I would say that the reasons that people join Al-Qaeda, probably my biggest learning curve in Iraq, was that it's a convenient convergence. As I told General Casey when he visited our prison, he asked why do people join, and uh, an intelligence officer gave him the standard appeal about Al-Qaeda ide uh, ideology and the reestablishment of a caliphate and Sharia law and what have you. And I disagreed. I said that there's this convenient convergence of a lot of different factors from social, economic, some religions, uh, but they're all very personal factors to each individual and they're aligning. Um, the first question was, why do professional interrogators differ on the opinion about whether or not torture works? And the reason why is because we differ over the definition of, what wor of, of the word works. Uh, if you're talking about short term, um, I know someone who was uh, Special Forces in Vietnam. He's participated in a lot of uh, clandestine operations and he told me a story of when torture did work. Uh, it's a very brutal story, but it worked uh, and he got the information he needed and he saved somebody's life. Uh, and he'll now tell you that he should have never done it and the costs of using it uh, in the long term far outweigh. I mean, it's the French experience in Algeria. This isn't groundbreaking stuff. Uh, where they stopped terrorist attacks but lost the support of the population. So we differ because we're differing over the term works. Uh, every technique works on someone. I, I, handing somebody a stick of gum will get somebody to talk. I guarantee you there's somebody in the world who will talk if you hand them a stick of gum. Um, the question is probability. And when you assess that probability, you have to look at both the short and long-term effects of using those techniques. Great. Well, thank you, Justine. Thank you, Matthew. That was great. Thank you. Is your book here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Email howtobreakaterrorist.com. <laughs> no, I, I didn't bring books to, to sell, but um, you can get them at Amazon.com and you can get them at Barnes and & Noble. And, and we uh, have the magazines out here for at least the synopsis <laughs> as an article. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.